Welcome back aliens, my name is Devin Reddy and in this video we'll talk about Coda. Hold on, we have talked about Coda in first two videos, right? It's time to actually look at the implementation, I know you're waiting for it. But the problem is, the moment we start with the example on an IDE, let's say we write a Java code for Coda, there are certain terms we have to understand first. So in this video, let's try to understand the key concepts so that it will be easier for us to understand the actual code. So let's start with the first one. See, the moment we, we talked about Coda, we, we said here, yeah, we'll be having a lot of enterprises and they want to communicate. How do you represent those enterprises on the network? So we can say one enterprise can have one node. Of course, one enterprise can have multiple nodes. So let's say we have Apple. So Apple want to be on the network, so Apple can have multiple nodes. But for this example, let's say Apple will have one node. Now this node will have what? So basically nodes represents the actual entity. So of course, right, Apple company will not be in the network. So we have, we need a computer there, we need, we need a node. Now this node will have a Coda application. So normally those are called as Coda apps, which is Coda distributed applications. Now in this application, you can write your logic, you can write your transactions, you can maintain the states. Hold on, what are those things? We'll talk about that later. But basically the company will be represented by a node on the network. Okay, now the moment we say one company, one node, what if you have multiple companies? And that's the main logic, right? You don't want to have one company working. So we, we need multiple companies or multiple enterprises working together, or they are sharing some data. And that's where we have multiple nodes, maybe one company, one node. Now, where, where you will put all these nodes? Of course, we have to connect them, right? Now, the, we, when you connect them, we, will, we can call them as network. So Coda provides a Coda network. Now the amazing thing is whenever you do some transactions, this data will not be distributed to all the nodes. No gossip protocol, okay? It's not a broadcasting of the data. We don't want that, right? From start, we are saying, hey, we want privacy. So in this case, Coda Network says, okay, don't worry, we will give you a point-to-point -point delivery of the, of the messages or the, or the updates, right? So it's not broadcasting, it is point-to-point. -point. So example, let's say in this network, we have five companies, only two companies are doing a transaction. So the first company, when they do the transaction or when they verify the transaction, they will send this message to the second company, not the entire network. But the amazing thing is, all the nodes in this network are well known. So they're not anonymous nodes. They are nodes which everyone knows about. But where you will keep all this data? Of course, right, every node will have an IP address. And you don't want to remember all the IP addresses, right? You will remember the names. Example, when I say we have Apple, Samsung, Intel in this, in this network, we don't want to remember their numbers, but their names. So how do you search a node by a name? And that's where we have a network map service. So this service will do a mapping of the name with the address. Okay, so we have talked about nodes and network, right? Now the thing is, when you talk about the node, it will have a code apps, right? Which is a code application. Now what these code apps will have? So the thing is, when we say we have multiple companies in the network or multiple nodes in the network, they will do some transactions, right? Now this transaction will have some constraints, some contracts. So we have to maintain data, we have to maintain the contracts. Now where do we do that? So of course we have to bundle them in a code application. Uh, maybe it is written in Java, so you can say a jar file. So in that jar file, you'll be having data, you'll be having the transaction, you'll be having contracts, right? Now question arises, where you will store that data? Now this data will be stored in a ledger. So every node will have its own ledger. Now what data you'll be having in this? So again, in a network, let's say we have five companies. Do you want to store the data of all the transactions? Of course, we don't want that, right? Privacy. So every node will have its own data and the data with the company it is dealing with. Now look at this image now. So we have A, B, C, D, and E. Now they are the part of this network. And if you can observe, it's a Venn diagram where you have multiple nodes and they are interacting. So let's say A is dealing with B, uh, B is dealing with C, and C is dealing with D, and D with E. Now in this case, of course, we can have multiple companies, let's say three companies uh, doing some transactions. So only those data will be stored with the individual nodes which they share with the other nodes. So example, if A is dealing with B, they will have the data, not all the nodes. And they will store this data in a ledger. Okay, so now we know that it will be stored in a ledger, right? But in which format? See, the thing is, we when you when talk about blockchain in general, we need two things. We want data. Of course, we want facts, not the wrong data. 
we want the current facts and we also want the history. So example, let's say this is an asset. Now this asset initially belonged to let's say A. Now A sold this asset to B, then B sold this asset to C. So of course we want to know who owns this asset. At this, at this stage, we, we know that C owns this asset. But then we also want to know the history, right? So where it came from. So let's say some company manufactured this phone and then they sold it to A, then A sold it to B and B to C. So that's the history we wanted to know. But the current status is it belongs to C. So if you think about it, it's the history plus the current fact. And this will be stored in a format of states. So you can imagine state as an immutable object. So it will represent the current values. So that's so simple, right? So this asset belongs to C. But let's say in future, if this asset is sold to D, now C is selling this asset to D. Now in this scenario, I mean, first of all, how, how this will happen? Now we know whenever you buy an asset, when you sell an asset, you do a transaction. So C and D is doing a transaction that is C is selling this asset to D. So that means you are changing the values of a state or you're changing the state with the help of a transaction. Hold on, we are not actually changing a state because state is immutable, right? So what we are doing is we are consuming the old state. We are creating a new state, right? So we are inputting. So we are using a state as an input and then we are outputting a state here. But then we are not changing the original state because it is immutable. So we are creating a new state. So that means we got the old state, we got a new state. The new state will become your current state, right? But what happens to the old state? That goes into history. So basically, whenever you want to update the ledger, you have to do some transactions. Now, it's not that easy. Of course, when you look at the code, you will understand more. But then let's say A and B, when A want to do a transaction, so A will propose a transaction. Now, why you have to propose a transaction? Because it might not go through. Transactions are atomic. It will either pass or it will fail, right? So for that, you have to make sure that when you propose a transaction, you have to sign it. Then B will sign it. And then that goes to the actual ledger. Now there's one more thing. Whenever you do a transaction, you have to specify your intention, right? Example, let's, let's say, if it, again, we talk about this asset when A is sending this asset to B, so that intention was sell. You're sending money, so you can say send, or when you are minting a money, you can say create. So you have to specify your intention, which will be helpful when you do some uh, contracts. Oh, with that, we have this word, which is contract. Now, why do we need a contract? So let's say you are selling this phone, of course. So let's, let's go with this phone again. So selling this phone, right? Now, the moment you do a transaction, there has to be some constraint, right? Of course, when, you, when someone wants to buy this phone, they have to make sure this is not damaged. Uh, they have to make sure that the, the amount which they are mentioning is not above the original price of this phone. Example, let's say this phone cost $100. No one should sell it for $150. So we have to check for those constraints, like it should not be damaged, it should be uh, less, than, less than the actual value and other factors. So basically, if anybody would check for the constraint, we can do that with the help of contracts. This is different from the smart contracts in other uh, blockchain. This is an actual contract, the legal contract, which you're talking about. So you can check all the facts. But what if the transaction is not matching with the contracts? In this case, the transaction will fail. If there's no issue, if contract says everything is good, the transaction will pass. Okay, but let's say we have an issue here. You are, do, you are selling this phone and then you are selling this phone in dollars, but the buyer wants to buy it in rupees. That means we have to do some exchange, right? We have to change from dollars to rupees. How will you know what's the actual value? What's the actual value of the dollar now? Or how will you do that conversion? Now for that, you need to get data from the external world and you can get it from the Oracle, and not the company, but that concept is called Oracle. So whenever you get data from the external world, we'll, we can get it from the Oracle. Okay, so simple thing, right? We have state, and when you want to update this state, you have to do transaction. But one thing is missing here. When you have so many transactions here, right? So let's say we have one transaction. In that one transaction, we have so many constraints, right? So first, the sender has to propose a transaction. Uh, then the other party will do a nod, okay? Go ahead. And then the sender will sign the transaction. The receiver will sign the transaction. And then it goes for other verification. So can you imagine how many steps we have here? Example, let's say you want to buy a house. So you have to sign. The borrower has to sign. Or the, the buyer has to sign. The bank has to sign. The insurance company has to sign. The notary has to sign. Has to sign. 
so many steps, right? Now you don't want to manage all the steps here. You want it to be automated or you want to automate it. For that, you can use flow, right? So all this transaction is a part of a flow. So if you want to do all the steps, create a flow. In fact, the best thing is you can create subflows. So if you think, hey, we have another task here, create a subflow. So we, we have talked about nodes, network, code apps, ledger, state, transactions, and flow. And now we are left with two important things. The, in fact, we have so many topics, but then let's focus on the important things here. The first one is consensus. Of course, right, we are talking about blockchain and we have not talked about consensus yet. See, the thing is, we know it's a permission blockchain, so of course all the nodes are known. So we don't have to verify the nodes, we don't have to verify the transactions. But yes, we have to do two things. First, whenever we do a transaction, we have to validate a transaction. Now that's a validity consensus. Now who will, vali who will validate? So what do you mean by validity here? First, it, it has to be signed by everyone. It should match all the contracts or all the constraint. If it is done, of course, you, now your transaction is valid. So that's the first one, validity consensus. The second one is, see, there's an issue of double spend, right? Example, when you talk about this phone, this is a real asset, right? This is a physical asset. So of course, if I'm selling this asset to someone else, I can do it only once. But if something is virtual, let's say NFTs, <laughs> let's say a photo. So let's say you have a virtual photo. Of course, you can send that photo to multiple people, right? How do you stop double spending? Now in that, so for that, you need central system. You need someone who will check the transition which you are doing is not happened earlier. In fact, Coda also follows UTXO, which is unspent transaction output. So whenever you have a state that's by default unconsumed, right? So the input should be unconsumed. The moment you, you, the moment you use this as an input and when you sell it to someone else, now this current state becomes consumed, right? So that central system in between will check for this. It will check for, it will check for the double spend problem. If you have used, if you have, Given the input and which is already consumed, it will give you error. It will give you exception. And who will do that? It will be done by Notary. So Notary is a special node in the network who is responsible to do the finalizing. Remember when you talked about transactions? So A will sign it, B will sign it. And then if everything goes well, the last part it will go to the Notary who will maintain it, right? So every time you do a transaction, Notary has to be there at the end at least to, to validate it. So basically we have two consensus here, the validity consensus and uniqueness consensus. So those are the key concepts. Of course we have so many concepts, but then these are important to actually start coding. And of course the moment we start with the code, uh, we can discuss about more theory, we can talk about, we can actually understand all those terms which in, in practical way. So that's it from this video, I hope you enjoyed. Let me know in the comment section and those are for further videos. Bye.